I think what we're looking at is a much more tailored approach um, to the uh, treatment of myeloma. Uh, you know, truly one size does not fit all. And again, you know, myeloma is multiple myeloma. So there are multiple uh, 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 biologies that we deal with under the umbrella of the diagnosis. And I think what we can now look to for our patients is a tailored approach. So, you know, conventional old systems of staging, for example, have been quickly being replaced by genetic profiles that are telling us more about about what we might expect from any patient's particular disease. And that's in turn informing us about how basically we should uh, optimize um, uh, the direction of therapy. I think it's very important to bear in mind that um, certain therapies can generate incredibly high quality responses and do so uh, very well, for example, high-dose melphalanin transplant, but there may be long-term consequences. And so long-term consequences include, unfortunately, secondary myelodysplasia and AML and setting of high-dose melphalan, rare but important. And then equally of note is that high-dose melphalan can engender genetic injury in the tumor cell that surviving tumor cell that emerges later, i.e. residual myeloma that emerges later, may have, in fact, a gene signature or whole genome uh, uh, sequencing um, that is more adverse. Now, this data is early, but it was some very important data was presented at the International Myeloma Workshop in September last year in Boston, and there was a very nice paper led by Dr. Ola Langren earlier this year. And the message there is that be careful of, of, of the long-term consequences of what you do. So looking to the future, we need to think strategically. And so that sort of helps me build the rest of the, the point I'm, I'm, I'm hoping is coming across, that we've got tailored options, we need to think to how we use them as we go forward, recognize their value, but also their potential long-term consequences. Now, all of this would not be important if we didn't have treatment options and we had no choice. The wonderful news is we have lots of choices. So as we sit right now, we have 12 novel drugs approved, several more coming very soon. We have a whole new treatment modality on the verge of approval, in my opinion, namely CAR-T therapy. So we have true immunotherapeutic platforms that are building that are looking so promising. And these range from CAR-T, obviously, to bispecific T-cell engagers, to other antibodies, including antibody drug conjugates, of which obviously belantamab, mafodotin is one that's been recently approved. We have new antibodies like isotuximab. And on top of that, we now have behind the scenes coming very soon is a whole new generation of novel agents like, and I'll give one example, um, the cell mods. Um, these are cerebral E3 ligase modulators, and ibertamide is the most advanced, and what we affectionately call 480 is not too far behind it. And when you think of that armamentarium, the future, I think, for our patients looks very, very bright because we've got lots of options for them, and we can further tailor. And when we tailor, we can now think not just tactically, we can think strategically and say, can I deploy a therapy now for which the consequences later in the patient's natural history will be minimal versus do I have to deploy an option now that may work very well for a period, but may have consequences later that, 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 that are more adverse. The very good news now is that we can afford to be much more selective and tailored in our approach going forward.